Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. In today's lesson, we begin studying Luke chapter 18, because we finished studying chapter 17 in our last lesson. The end of chapter 17 contains some of Christ's teaching on His second coming. What he said is of great importance as we are rushing towards his soon return. When Dr. Luke wrote his gospel, there were no chapters or verses. If we remove for a moment the chapter and verse divisions that divide the end of chapter 17 from that of chapter 18, we would see that there is a smooth transition. It's the same event where Jesus was teaching the disciples about his second coming. He warns them at the end of chapter 17 that on the night of his return, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left, and that two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken and the other left. There's a couple of interesting thoughts I want to present to you about these two verses. Two people in bed would have to be a husband and wife, and they were sleeping at night. The one spouse was ready for Jesus' return, and the other wasn't. The two women were grinding during the day, probably at a village mill. One was ready to meet Jesus, and the other wasn't. There are two points that could be implied from these verses, but we mustn't force these ideas since it's speculation, but it's interesting nonetheless. Given that one person is taken at night and the other at day, and that the snatching away is the same event, it would speak of people being in different time zones. Of course, that wasn't understood in that day, but Jesus knew it. The aspect of different time zones clearly implies that the earth is round and rotates around the sun. Since the rapture of the church will happen at the same moment all over the world, there will be some at work and others sleeping. Only those who are in right fellowship with Jesus will be taken. All the rest will be left behind. As we dig into chapter 18, Jesus makes a transition from talking about his second coming to address the subject of persevering prayer. This teaching on persistent prayer fits perfectly with our Lord's teaching on his second coming and shows how some will be ready to meet Jesus and others won't. This reveals that the subject of persevering prayer is of tremendous importance if we are to maintain our spiritual life, especially as the world grows more like it was in the days of Noah and Lot. The importance of this parable means that we must take to heart the subject of prayer and apply these truths to our lives. Prayerless people will not make heaven their home, and it's irrelevant if they call themselves Christians or prayed the sinner's prayer. The biblical faith is all about relationship with the Savior, who is our atoning sacrifice so we could know Christ in a real and tangible way. Prayerless people aren't in fellowship with Jesus, which means they are outside of salvation. Their prayerlessness is proof that they don't love Him. Those who love Jesus want to spend time with Him, and those who don't spend time with Him prove that they don't love Him. Sentimental feelings aren't enough to get people into heaven. There must be an authentic relationship that's rooted in Christ's work on the cross, and this will always produce repentance and surrender. Those who haven't truly surrendered their life to the Savior will have a hard time understanding the parable we are going to study, since they don't have a real relationship with Him. It takes knowing Christ in a real way to experience the joy, peace, and strength that comes through prayer. Reciting prayers isn't praying, since it doesn't come out of the heart, but is mere ritual. Try reciting the same thing over and over to your spouse and see what happens to your marriage. It will fall apart, for you will drive your spouse absolutely loony. We try to do with God what's destructive to human relationships. God is a person and our relationship with Him should be no less real and personal than what it is with people. The parable of the persistent widow is one of the few parables that come with an explanation before the parable is given. In Luke 18, verse 1, we are given two points or lessons that Jesus wants us to glean from this parable. Luke wrote, Jesus then told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. The two points are obvious, with the first being that we should always pray and the second that we should not give up. Before we dig into these two points, I think we need to look at what motivated Jesus to give this parable. I've already alluded to this in the opening thoughts of this lesson. At the end of chapter 17, Jesus was teaching on some important aspects of what the world will be like before his second coming. He taught that in the last days it would be like it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. 
One pervading aspect of the wicked condition of mankind is their defiance against God and their refusal to make Him central to their life. In the days of Noah and Lot, the people lived without any acknowledgment of God, and this is in direct violation of the reason why all of mankind was created. In other places of Scripture, we are told of the violence of Noah's day, and in Lot's day, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were consumed with sexual sins. All of this is taking place in our world right now and is increasing by the moment. The mass of humanity is either hostile to God or chooses to live without any acknowledgment of Him. Our world is violent and loves violence, even making it central to our entertainment. The obsession with sex continues to explode as younger and younger people are getting pulled into horrendous sexual perversion, even into sex changes and identifying themselves as animals. This is all very demonic. At the same time, seniors are giving over to more perversion than at any time in human history. They used to be a moral stabilizer. Instead, their sexual addiction is getting a firm grip on them. This is proved by the explosion of STDs among them. As the sexual insanity spreads, it's touted as being normal and even acceptable. Yet all these perversions are declared by a holy God to be utterly wicked and evil. Behind all the violence and sexual perversion are demons drawing people into traps that will keep them from coming to Christ. How are the redeemed to stand against such an onslaught of evil that's coming out of the depths of hell? We must always pray and not give up. There has never been a time in human history where people could save themselves from sin and its consequences. There has always been and will only be one Savior, and that's Jesus. If we are to overcome this world and the evil spirits that push violence and sexual perversion, then we must tap into the only power that can make us overcomers. It's absolutely necessary that we must always pray and not give up. This isn't an option. Failure to obey this command opens us up to temptation and demonic influences that could produce our eternal demise. People don't backslide because they love Jesus supremely. They backslide because they don't. Praying always and not giving up can only come through a rich love for God that causes people to press into this wonderful relationship we are offered with Jesus. There are monks that can pray without ceasing by repetitiously reciting prayers over prayer beads and rosaries, yet this isn't true prayer as defined by God's Word. Jesus isn't teaching that we must always be on our knees or in some posture of prayer, and He doesn't want us to repetitiously recite written prayers. Jesus isn't teaching that prayer must be constantly on our lips or in our minds since there are occupations that require our full attention. The point is that when our mind is free from the demands of the day, that the first thoughts that come to our mind is communion with Jesus. We also need to be quick to offer a prayer when we see a need of one sort or another. Yet this kind of continuous and spontaneous prayer throughout the day doesn't take the place of those times when we meet with Jesus all alone without any distractions. Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. To pray in the Spirit is to pray with other tongues that comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul is teaching us to use this gift on a constant basis, and this is one way that we can pray without ceasing. Now add to this our need to stay spiritually alert so that we can keep on praying for all the saints, and we can begin to see how we can pray without ceasing. If we are to survive this evil world so that we can make heaven our eternal home, then we must abide in fellowship with Jesus, and an integral part of this is to pray without ceasing. This is serious, but most of the American church doesn't take this seriously at all because they haven't seen their own danger. Coupled with Christ's command to pray without ceasing, as Paul worded it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, must be a holy persistence where we refuse to give up no matter what comes our way. Persevering prayer can only come out of a deep abiding relationship with Jesus and with a heart filled with compassion for others. People can pray regularly and even pray much, but if they don't have a burning love for Christ, then when a severe trial comes their way, they give up and stop praying because they have grown angry at God and the world. This is exactly what the hordes of hell want us to do. They know that when we give up, we are coming out from under God's protection. We are then left exposed to spiritual assaults from hell, and there's no way we can stand against them through human strength and wisdom. When bitterness, anger, lust, depression, or a host of other sins grab hold of people, then they are enslaved to demons and the lusts of their flesh. 
there's something more to this that's important for us to understand. When we pray without ceasing, we can give ourselves in prayer for the needs of others, as well as properly praying for ourselves. Paul told us in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. We are to be devoted to Christ through prayer, and this is what Jesus taught and modeled to His disciples. We clearly see this in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, with how the primitive church was devoted to prayer, and that's why the Spirit's power was poured out through them. Central to devotion in prayer is thankfulness, which is all about praise. Grumpy people are usually not praying people because their grumpiness against God will cause them to keep their distance from Him. When people give up in prayer, they not only cease praying for their own needs, but their self-absorption causes them to stop praying for others. Our prayerlessness for others is a sin of omission, which means it's a sin over what we are failing to do and be. When we commit sins of omission, we are certainly going to be committing sins of commission, which are sins that we are actively practicing. Whenever we are consumed with our own trials, pain, and selfish ambition, we will no longer see the perishing souls that are all around us or the needs of the saints. What Jesus is teaching on prayer is extremely important, and it's time to rethink how we have viewed prayer and what Jesus had to say about it in this parable. In verses 2 and 3, Jesus said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. There are two people involved in this parable and the circumstances that brought them into each other's lives. Some people call this parable the unjust judge, but I don't think that's a good name for it, since the focus is upon the judge and not the woman. A better name for the parable is the persistent widow, because Jesus is making her the focal point of this lesson. He wants his disciples to mimic her, not the unjust judge. Now let's begin looking at the judge. Jesus referred to him as a man that neither feared God nor cared about men. From a Jewish mindset, this judge wasn't a devout religious Jew, but appears to be more of an agnostic. He's also presented as a fair and impartial judge that isn't swayed by people, politics, or bribes. In the beginning of the parable, he holds to a strict standard of the law, but in time he responds to the woman out of self-interest. Jesus isn't making the judge to represent God because the judge is unjust, while God is perfect in righteousness and justice. God is also perfectly fair and equitable and will never act out of selfishness as did the unjust judge. As will come out later in the parable, God avenges or defends his children quickly when the time is right, while the unjust judge takes a lot of time to be persuaded to do what's right. These examples point us to the fact that God always does the right thing, but the unjust judge must be pressured to do so. There are other comparisons that we can make to prove that Jesus wasn't equating the unjust judge to the Heavenly Father, but I have said enough on it. Now let's look at the persistent widow. The first thing we see about her is that she is a widow, and must have either been childless or had young children that couldn't help her in a court of law. Jesus was presenting a very radical situation because women weren't allowed in a court of law, nor were they allowed to testify in a court for any reason. If a woman saw a murder and a man didn't, then the murder can't be prosecuted because the testimony of a woman wasn't valid. Okay, ladies, don't get mad at me. I'm only teaching what the Mosaic Law said and sharing the cultural dynamics into which Jesus was speaking. When you see this ban on women in a court of law, it becomes a little more understandable why the unjust judge ignored her. He didn't have anything against the widow other than that she was a woman and had no legal right to be in his court. If the widow would have had a son old enough, then he could have taken her case to court. But the point that she came herself shows that she was all alone and didn't have an advocate. The woman's request is, Grant me justice against my adversary. The King James wrote, Avenge me of mine adversary. Adam Clark brings out a very interesting point on the widow's request. He wrote that a better translation of the Greek is, Do me justice against my adversary, or vindicate me from my adversary. This is why most newer translations use justice instead of vengeance. Clark went on to write, If the woman had come to get revenge, as our common translation intimates, I think our blessed Lord would have never had permitted her to have an honor of place in the sacred records. She desired to have justice, and that only, and by her importunity she got that which the unrighteous judge had no inclination to give, but merely for his own ease. 
I agree with Clark that the Lord wouldn't have given a parable that advocated revenge, especially seeing how vengeful we can be and how that evil attitude can be passed on from one generation to the next. God is just, and He loves justice, as we are told in Micah chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn son for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, to act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There is an abundance of verses that teach on our responsibility to institute justice, such as Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Wash, and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Then you have the challenging verses found in Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, where the Lord proclaims, I hate, I despise your religious feasts, I cannot stand your assemblies, even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Justice is something the Lord demands of mankind in general, and has redeemed all the more because they should understand the importance of justice and mercy. I said all this to give some strong evidence that Jesus had to be talking about justice and not vengeance. Jesus didn't need to insert what expression of justice the widow was asking for, It's enough that a righteous cause was at stake. The need for justice was so acute that the widow kept pleading her case before the unjust judge, who had no regard for the injustice that was inflicted upon her because she was a woman. Jesus went on to say in verses 4 and 5, For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. Don't forget the purpose of this parable is to show the power of persistent prayer. The need for persistence comes into play whenever there is some kind of resistance to our prayer or the Lord is wanting us to desire to do His will to such an extent that we will give Him no rest until He answers. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is visited by a heavenly being, and there is much debate over who this being is. The visitation is so powerful and overwhelming that all the men with Daniel fled in terror. In verse 10, Daniel wrote, A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. This heavenly being said to Daniel in verses 12 and 13, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me twenty-one days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. The point I want to make from all this is that this heavenly being was facing resistance of some sort, so there was real need to persevere until the victory came. If this was true for a heavenly being, then how much more is this true for those who live in this wicked world? We need to persevere through every obstacle and not let anything, no matter how difficult or painful it may be, to keep us from pressing into Jesus. This is also true of Jesus as we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus faced more opposition from more diabolical enemies than any person ever faced in the history of mankind. Jesus wasn't merely under attack from wicked men that were motivated by demons. The Lord had to fight against Satan along with whatever demons were helping him. Men and devils were doing everything within their power to silence Jesus, but they utterly failed because Jesus perfectly finished everything the Father sent him to do. The widow in the parable had to persevere and not give up to get a request for justice answered, and Jesus is a wonderful example of this. Through this parable, Jesus is striving to instill in us the same godly purpose to not give up no matter what opposition comes against us. Life can get hard, and we don't always understand what's going on or why everything seems to be going wrong. It's at such times faith needs to rise up, 
along with a trust in the goodness of God, even when life doesn't seem good. God is always faithful, and when we put faith into action to persevere until we get the answer to our prayer, the Lord is going to respond at the right time. The unjust judge eventually yielded to the persistent widow's request. Why? Because she was wearing the man down. But that's not the case with God. We can't wear him down. The Lord always does what is right because He is righteous and His infinite patience and power can't be worn out. He will respond to unbelief and rebellion with discipline or judgment. But He lovingly and kindly responds to those who love and prove that love through faith, surrender, and obedience. In verses 6 and 7, the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night? Will He keep putting them off? The point of the parable is that the judge's lack of compassion was overcome by the widow's persistence. How much more will a good and loving God give justice to His chosen ones who love and adore Him? It's in these two verses that God's character is demonstrated to be totally different from that of the unjust judge. Jesus wasn't trying to compare the unjust judge with that of Father God. He was actually striving to make a strong contrast between the two. If an unjust judge eventually responded to the woman's constant badgering, how much more will the just judge, who is compassionate and loving, care for his children that are persistently praying to him? God isn't like Santa Claus. The gifts he gives are for our eternal well-being, not merely to gratify our desire for more toys and stuff. The Lord wants us to pray according to his will because he knows that's what we need the most. He knows that when we pray that He is glorified in the earth, that it gives real purpose to our lives and delivers us from destruction that comes through self-absorption. This is why He wants us to pray about the needs of others, because it gets our eyes off of ourselves onto Him. And He wants us to pray about our own needs and those of our family because He wants to meet our true needs. The Lord won't answer those prayers that will bring harm to others or to the ones who's praying, and this is further proof that we must pray according to God's will. His will is always best for us, even when it may appear to be otherwise. He is out for our eternal good, not our temporal happiness. Yet when our temporal happiness isn't contrary to our eternal good, then He will offer answer such prayers. The Lord does answer the casual prayer when the life is right with Him. But most of all, He's wanting us to want Him enough that we will seek Him with all of our heart. Jesus must be the principal object we are seeking and the passion of our heart. When that's the case, then our prayers are going to be more in line with His will. It's when our heart wanders from Him that idolatrous loves and passions begin to replace the Lord, and this is a very dangerous place to be in. As long as our focus is to know Christ and the power of His resurrection, then our prayers will be rightly directed and not selfishly focused upon ourselves. Now we come to verse 8 where Jesus concludes this parable with a serious warning. The Lord said, I tell you, He will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The Lord promised that when we seek him like the persistent widow, that we will receive justice from him at the proper time. What does Jesus mean by the word quickly? It seems to me that our definition of quickly is different from the Lord's definition. The same is true for the definition of soon. What does quickly and soon mean to a timeless being? that every moment is as soon to him as any other moment. Yet the Lord is working in human history for the salvation of all who would heed his call to salvation. He definitely knows what we mean by quickly and soon. When we are going through trials, we want God to quickly respond. And if he doesn't, then we are prone to grow angry at him. When we are hurting or in need, or know someone who is in need, we want God to immediately come to their rescue. Yet the Lord does His work with infinite precision and makes no mistakes in how He deals with the souls of men. The world is full of evil that produces a seemingly endless list of miseries, yet the Lord sees it all and He cares about our suffering more than we can comprehend. We want God to respond the moment we pray, but He always acts quickly when the time is right. For us time-bound people, we want His response right now. But the Lord is never late, nor is He early. He's always on time, and when it's the right time, He does what He does quickly. This is the same with His second coming. We are told that He's coming soon, but that's not according to our definition of soon, but according to His. 
One day his definition of soon will coincide with ours, and he will break through the clouds in his glorious second coming. Until that day, we need to continue to define soon according to our definition so that we stay ready to meet him when he comes in the clouds. When Jesus cracks open the heavens to come down, he will quickly finish the work. Until that time, we need to live ready by praying like the persistent widow. We must continue to persevere until Jesus comes for his spotless bride, or we die to go home to be with him forever. In either case, our need is to persevere, and this is why Jesus taught this principle. Persevering prayer needs to be an integral part of our walk with Jesus if we are to hear well done from his lips when we die. What does it mean to ask for justice and for the Lord to give justice? Our usual idea about the need of justice is due to our seeing the expressions of injustice that abound in our wicked world. This is true, and the Lord does answer such prayers. Yet this also depends on how we are praying to receive justice. If bitterness and unforgiveness are the motives behind our prayers for justice, then we aren't wanting justice but vengeance, and God will not answer those kind of prayers. This is some real-life issues for those who suffer persecution around the world. We could come up with all kinds of ideas about what it means to ask the Lord for justice and what it means for Him to give it. Let's make this simple. We should be crying out to God to rescue the souls of men, women, and children, and for this reason that He would grant us justice against our true enemies, which are the legions of hell. Yes, people are suffering under the wages of sin, and they justly deserve damnation. But we should be crying out for their salvation, and this should be the largest subject of our prayer life. What would happen if churches were full of praying people, like that persistent widow, and were crying out day and night for the salvation of the lost and victory over their demonic oppressors? We might see revival break out. We might see a flood of souls come into the kingdom of God. We would see biblical conversions that are radical and revolutionary. Now we come to Christ's solemn warning. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is a terrifying question. It causes me concern about my own spiritual condition. Will he find in me a good and faithful servant when he returns? Will he see true faith working in me through persevering prayer? What is the problem with our faith that Jesus is confronting us over? Faith that's expressed through persistent persevering prayer won't give up or grow discouraged. This is prayer that will not rest until the Lord quickly answers. How much of this kind of prayer do you see in the church today? How much, if any, is in your own life? This is another sign of Christ's soon return, an apostate church that's not living out the true faith, but has become lukewarm and defined by compromise. Much of the modern church has become friends with the world rather than missionaries to win the world to Christ. Where are the praying churches? They are almost gone. They're almost non-existent. The first meetings to stop in the church is the prayer meeting, and it's also the hardest one to get going. Why is this? Because there's no holy fire burning in the church, no passion that compels her to seek the face of God until he rains Holy Spirit fire down upon his church so that the glory of God would flow through her to reach a perishing world. When Jesus returns, will he find faith in you? Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Come drink your fill Let healing walk